like for the last six weeks, they I would say maybe a bit less um, releases than usual, and mainly uh, maybe because Johan and myself we've been really uh, focusing on a lot of uh, tooling work, and there's still a lot of work going on. I thought we would be over, but there's still a lot of things going on in Sampler. Uh, we're improving the code. It should not impact anything. Hopefully, let us know if you have issues. But um, with the system we have, usually we can just make sure we create a new release. And then, um, and then it's transparent to you next time you build, you're just going to pick up the next versions. Um, I would recommend every now and then when you build um, a community module to delete completely your output folder and just rebuild from there. Make sure you git pull and then rebuild from there because uh, you will resolve the dependency on that and choose that you pull the latest uh, sampler on the other sampler module. So sampler, sampler, GitHub task and things like this. Usually you don't need to do that often. Um, you probably still find for the old versions because it mainly happens when you are uh, doing this, um, when you're building and you're publishing a module, but that's done by the uh, Azure DevOps agent. So usually you don't, have, you don't have to do it, but just in case, remember to do that maybe once every month or once every two months. Uh, that being said, if you have any question, you can just uh, ask okay. away later or can. Okay, maybe maybe one question about the sampler. Um, yeah, seen that there is a lot of movement in the sampler project. Can you summarize maybe the progress of the last well, the, the the top three items that you have added to the sampler in the last couple of weeks? Yes, uh, I'll go for the last six weeks. Last six weeks, um, I'll get back to this here because then uh, then probably Johan and myself will, will discuss a, a few things over there. So at the moment, I'll just leave that here. The, Mainly, uh, yes. So th there's a few releases there. Uh, X fail of a cluster and um, XDNS server on that deprecated. So we're moving to DNS server DSC. There's been a lot of work actually. Uh, maybe Johan, you want to take that one on. There's a lot of work that's been done by a new community member. And uh, that's pretty amazing. The, the work is put into it. And then how the, uh, how the, the uh, DSC resources are changing using class-based DSC resources, like there are a lot of things going on there. So maybe, uh, Johan, you can summarize this. Uh, yes, we have gotten a lot of work from a new maintain, uh, a contributor. And uh, he's been really busy adding a lot of new uh, uh, resources to manage records in the, in the Microsoft DNS server. And it's uh, some of the existing resources have been changed to uh, been deprecated and changed to class-based resources, and uh, that's one part of the work we've done in Sampler to get uh, coverage working for this uh, module. Um, so uh, also there's a lot of uh, resources that have been created to move stuff out of uh, the DNS service setting resource uh, that actually was uh, just to make, to make resources more, um, uh, have less, uh, less settings uh, and a resource that set a, a few settings rather than have a large uh, a resource that sets a large, a lot of settings. But also, there's uh, there's a commandlet uh, that is set uh, from the DNS server module that's called set DNS server setting, I think, and that is actually setting a lot of properties that does not yet exist in the the source DNS server setting. So we are moving out a lot of properties that was in some cases duplicated with diagnostics resource and uh, into separate resources. And then we're gonna move in a lot of new properties into that resource in the DNS server setting resource to actually uh, be able to configure settings that have, have not been able to be configured yet. Yep, yep. so that's the work. Yeah, so um, I'm showing at the same time I was showing a bit uh, some of the work. So there's a few things that we can we can uh, explain as well. So obviously uh, feel free to browse this repository. And what I find interesting is uh, something we discussed a few times, but we've 
haven't really showed um, uh, inheritance and how you can use inheritance between your d different DSC uh, uh, classes. Um, and this one is a good example because, as I showed you, you've got lots of different classes, and then you have a DSC resource base here that uh, the other DSC resources are inheriting. So then, a lot of um, information, a lot of the code can be written once and then reused in the other ones. So I find this pretty interesting. Um, I think when we had the presentation from Bartek, uh, he actually uh, talked about it. But and, and he's, I know he's using it, but uh, we haven't seen that much example. So now you have. Uh, DNS server DSC to look at this. So that's a pretty big release, and um, we had lots of uh, lots of commits uh, coming from. Uh, actually, yeah, there we go. There he is, uh, James. So he's done a lot of changes, uh, and thank you a lot for your changes. I don't know if you're online right now, maybe not, uh, but a lot. For, thank you for the changes. It's been like. A, doing a lot of a lot of things in there that was pretty amazing and he's been working with uh, johan a lot so that one uh, was a big change and remember that uh, it used to be called x uh, dns server i know it's dns server dsc that's pretty recent that happens within the last six weeks there, there hasn't been a full release of that uh, dns server dsc yet but uh, there's pre no it's not even a preview out yet we are missing oh, the uh, preview is yeah, we're missing an API key to uh, be able to deploy the preview. Yeah, it's on you, but uh, <laughs> you have been busy with other things. That's no, not important. But, okay, I told you I miss yeah. I miss some stuff. Yeah, most so, uh, uh, XDNS XDNS server is uh, containing all the all these uh, most of this this work still though. So so yeah. uh, you, that can be used for now. Hey Gail, Gail, is it worth? mentioning how a resource and why a resource goes from X to not X? Because I know a lot of, this is something we obviously did long, many years ago, but it might yes, be clear so, to everyone that process. Yes, yeah, so the main reason, so I would say the main reason is um, it, like we used to have a naming convention, which was X for experimental, C for community and things like this. And then eventually after many communications, like there was different things. Let's just remember that uh, we should just move away and then we should uh, specify whether it's uh, up to the uh, high quality resource module standard or not. I would say in a slightly different way, but um, but usually you know, with this principle, it's easier when you have a resource to uh, call it um, uh, HQRM, like to make it HQRM, it's slightly easier because we have a lot of tests and a lot of uh, validations that can go in. Is that is that does that answer enough, uh, Daniel, or do should we need to give more information? Yeah, no, I mean it, it, absolutely, because I mean from from a background perspective, X used to mean experimental, and of course a lot of people misunderstood what that meant and wouldn't use resources in production, but if they had an X and that sort of thing. So the goal was always to move all community resources away from X, but to do so, we needed to get them up to a quality where we could really support them adequately. And, and those modules are still moving. So if you've got any that you kind of go, look, I, I'd love to use, but I can't because it's an X, then help us get those to the HQRM standard and we can remove that X and make everyone feel, you know, feel the, feel the comfort of using those in production. But if it's not a problem, don't worry. <laughs> Yep, and and I want to re-add as well something that probably I'm saying. I hope I'm saying every every community calls. Um, everyone can review a pull request, and maybe you're not going to be uh, you're not going to have the rights to validate, but it really helps us if someone goes through the code before we do, and then just goes and and give feedback to whoever raised that pull request. Maybe they need some help uh, writing a test. Maybe uh, they've done everything. But you know, when you write, I don't know, a few thousand lines or even a few hundred lines, you may have typos or things. Something like just uh, reviewing the code and then helping people um, going a bit further. If we see someone has been already reviewed the request, for us, we can just go much quicker and we don't have to, to be as thorough, at least for a first review. And then we can see, okay, that looks good. Let's go uh, full details and then it's uh, going to be quick, uh, released quicker. So if you're not too sure again, feel free to reach us on us on Teams or Slack, and then we can help you. But again, anyone can review per request. And um, so, do you know what has changed in oh SharePoint DSC? SharePoint DSC is already released because uh, Eureka and the other contributors are just 
um, always working on this, so that's moving pretty fast. Um, if I remember correctly, this one actually has the reverse DSC capability built in. No, it, yes, no. I think it does have the reverse yes. DSC capability built in added. Yeah, uh, but I, I think they, I think they removed it. No, no they removed they, the, they, the they dependency. Yeah, they removed the dependency. Yeah, it's still built in, right? Yeah. So, so uh, reverse DSC capability is built in. Um, it, but to be able to use it, you will need to externally manage uh, installing reverse DSC. Um, but uh, the, the the module, because otherwise you would have to pull everything. And it wouldn't load if you didn't have it, and that would be a bit more complicated to manage. But then, if you have reverse DSC, you can just use reverse DSC to your SharePoint. We should actually get the the contributors to uh, do a demo at some point. That that'd be good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, maybe so Nick in, as well. Yeah, so in Excel or cluster or stuff that is a is a exchange added a, just a par parameter for, for block cache size for cluster share volume. So a small change. Okay. And uh, SharePoint DSC storage DSC, like there's a few previews that have been released as well. Uh, feel free to have a look at this. And again, uh, when you've tested on and if you tested one of those, one of the preview, and then it's working for you, please let us know even in the chat and then say, yeah, I've tested these, I've, I've tested the change. So then we know that it's uh, it's probably safe to release. So again, we would tag the, the uh, we would tag the repository and promote the pre-release to a release uh, a bit quicker if we know people have tested it. And again, it's up to the maintainers to do this. So you can also ping the maintainers to uh, say, hey, uh, I want the new fix, I want the new change. Can you please release it? Or when will you release it? Yeah. All right. Man, man, I anyway. just said that man, a few of these uh, previews was released uh, today uh, because we, uh, Daniel added uh, code coverage and we needed to release, do a build on main just to get the, the code coverage for the main branch uh, up to code call IO. So. Perfect transition listen. because yeah. I was about to discuss this and I was actually about to ask Daniel and yourself to, to talk about it. So what is code coverage and, and what does it do and uh, how can we consume it? Uh, should I start maybe? It, we have, so as I mentioned in the DNS server DSC, we added class-based resources and because of that we had to uh, change sampler to actually to support code coverage for uh, for uh, built modules and this this uh, doesn't just work with the class based resource now it actually works with regular modules uh, like our common modules uh, dc resource common doc generator and etc or uh, a module you build by your own uh, sampler is one one uh, that uses it too so the reason i um, like code coverage is because as a maintainer, uh, or when I do reviews, I can fast the I can fast see if a pull request, uh, the test in a pull request actually covers everything uh, that the, that it uh, proposes to change. So that that's the main reason I, I really like, and I will often work and make sure code coverage work. And as uh, Gail shows here, we had added the uh, code coverage for. Uh, Azure DevOps. It has actually worked before for for MOF-based resources, uh, but now it's actually show the code for uh, the built modules as well. Uh, and we also added the uh, the uh, the service codecov.io, and the different the main difference I think with codecov.io is it actually on pull requests. It actually, if uh, Gail, if you open a pull request, a recent yeah, pull actually, request. I should, I should go in the pull request because uh, it will show you the commands closed. And uh, actually, that's probably the, uh, that's the correct one. Yeah. Yeah, that was my, uh, okay, so here you go. So, yeah, so here, so for, as a, a reviewer, is if I can easily see uh, how this, uh, PR except uh, FX coverage. 
So I can see if it raises or lowers the coverage and I can see how many hits and misses. And often you want to see green on both of these. It's, it should be a, a negative number of misses and it should be a positive number of, on, on hits. Uh, or it can also be a zero on misses, of course, but depending on the PR. Uh, so in this case, uh, in this PR, we added uh, uh, all the build talks to the coverage, that, which uh, none of these build talks are actually tested. So that's why it says uh, it's a, a positive number for misses here with over 1000 hits. So we have uh, uh, some work to actually get this uh, up to some standard. So, and the status check that Gail showed previously, it will always be, uh, if you go to the, if you go to the root root of the repository. Uh, you mean uh, on you the mean, GitHub? Okay. This one, good. Yeah, yeah. So on we. Oh, you mean there's, this? A, uh, there's an X up there on the on the commit, uh, the red X, uh, and that will always show uh, red until we actually it comes up into the level of coverage we have defined in the code called YAML file. So it says I think uh, eighty percent. There, yeah. 70 percent uh, the target so yes, as long as we are under 70 uh, it's gonna show that we are not uh, um oh we haven't reached the target yeah the we're coverage. not there yet so so we use so something that we used was in the build yaml where we had a code coverage threshold and that is just like a very basic um guardrail to say okay never drop under but it's not very clever because it's only used the uh, existing code coverage from um, from Pesta. But when we do that, uh, when we test locally, usually we test on the on one machine, and then maybe we're not testing with all the test cases. Because if we if we have too many tests, we just don't want to uh, run all of them. For instance, we just want to run some of them. So it's never very useful. So sometimes you can set it up uh, to zero in the code coverage uh, threshold of the build.yaml. So here, and then we have code cover threshold. This one is 1%. So if it goes below, it will fail your build locally. But um, uh, but the idea is when we use code curve, we can have much more granular and much more precise because it depends on the uh, XML output that we've created. And then that means you can also test, let's say, on Windows and test on Linux, uh, a module, uh, some resources. And then you can merge those two um, Jacoco reports. And then based on that, uh, the code coverage should be accurate with everything you have. And that's something that uh, Johan and Jurek especially have been uh, working on as well. It was before that actually, but uh, but yeah. Yeah, so we can we can show this merge uh, if you go to Azure Pipeline CML uh, to the code coverage. Uh, uh, you, okay, you mean in the pipeline here, right? Yeah. So there's two jobs, uh, actually there are four jobs, I think, uh, that tests, yeah. uh, runs unit tests. Yeah. So, so oh, the, we, we, yeah, we upload uh, a test our artifact for each uh, pest run. And then there's a job at the end uh, that, uh, so there's a job that's called uh, code coverage. Merge, which is on the next uh, stage, I think, code yeah. coverage. So, yeah, so it depends. Yeah, it depends on all the four four jobs, and then it downloads all the artifacts. And uh, there's an there you there's a job that Yorick uh, add uh, Yorick that uh, maintains the SharePoint DC has built uh, that actually merge all the the result files from all the uh, the jobs that run tests and uh, into a single coverage file that's uh, in this case is called uh, Yakoko coverage XML. And that is uploaded to both uh, Azure Code Coverage and Code Co. IO. So, so that's pretty, the idea. pretty cool. 
Yeah, so you can do the different tests in different OSs. So that's why we're doing uh, Windows PowerShell 5, uh, Windows Core, and then uh, Linux with PowerShell Core. And I think we do also Mac OS, PowerShell Core. That, that's why we've got four OSs. And then, you know, the code path are not necessarily the same because there's difference in uh, the code path depending on the OS. And that just merges the different output and then calculates um, the total code coverage based on that. So I think that's pretty cool, and that gives us a good indication of uh, the code coverage across OSs for the code we have. Mm. Yeah, and in uh, SharePoint DC, they they have also uh, different functionality in different SharePoint versions, so the unit test uh, different versions of SharePoint uh, on different OSs. So th so there's a different there that sh uh, they need to merge together, like like we do here. But this yes. So for them, it's yeah. maybe the same OSs, but they're using they are creating stubs of the SharePoint uh, libraries. So they have the stubs, and they just do the unit test against all of those to make sure their commands works with um, all of the uh, lib libraries that are available for the different SharePoint versions. So mm -hmm. similar again, and because it takes, they have a huge amount of tests, and that would take hours and hours, but because they can parallelize to the different version, it's much quicker for them to run them like this. Amazing stuff. I think that's pretty cool to have to have this level of uh, of testing framework going on for, for these high quality resource modules. If you have any question, feel free to ask now while I get back to the agenda. And where was I? You, you yep. mentioned reverse DSC, um, and that, and, and uh, from what I remember of it, so I, I used it previously. It used to be that you had uh, the the base module for reverse DSC, and then there was a bunch of separate components um, for different um, um, sources. So I think there was one for SQL, there was one for RIS. Um, but then you also mentioned that the SharePoint one was baked into the SharePoint resources. Is is there a direction there, or is it kind of accidental at the moment? So it's not really accident. Well, um, it's up to the maintainers if they want to add it. So in this case, Yorick and the other, I, I can't remember the names of the other maintainers, I'm afraid. And maybe some of them are in the call already. I, I actually don't know. But um, um, it's, so reverse DSC in itself. So it, I think it changed architecture from the beginning. So like a few years ago, it was slightly different. And now you have a core module um, and then in this case, for SharePoint DSC, they um, they allow you like to uh, reverse uh, the DSC configuration uh, based on um, uh, on that, that leverage the core module. So they just added the extension, so then they can use the DSC resource and the core extension or the core um, uh, reverse DSC to be able to reverse engineer the installation of a SharePoint. Um, there's so. It's not a pattern that is generalized, and I don't think I would recommend it. Uh, that's something obviously up for discussion. Personally, I, I wouldn't recommend it in every case. I think in SharePoint, and in, in some cases, it makes sense to be able to reverse engineer everything. Um, but uh, you need to be careful with what you're doing, as always. So um, I think it's interesting to be able to get the data, but technically, you could do that with a get. But let's think about a file resource. What do you want? Like if you reverse DSC when you have file resources, what do you expect the output? To list all the files of your file system, to, to get all the, the information about your files. And that's why in, in some use cases, it might be difficult to apply the reverse DSC principle. In some other, like SharePoint, maybe it makes complete sense. SharePoint, Office 365, like there's, a, there's some... Um, there's some components that make sense to be able to query what's going on and then extract this information. So I'm honestly not an expert in reverse DSC. Um, reverse DSC, especially for the use case. So a lot of these people using it are uh, consultants, Microsoft consultants. So they need to know, like they go to a customer, they need to understand what's going on so then they can reproduce the same environment in a lab, for instance, to see what's going on, reproduce the error, troubleshoot without affecting the live sites. So they're just taking a reverse DSC and then reapply on the other side. And, and that makes complete sense. Um, if you're trying to do your configuration yourself from scratch, maybe reversing what is not yet in DSC might be actually the wrong approach. So that's why there's always the case, okay, what are you trying to achieve? Um, 
so there's two things. What are you trying to achieve? Is it the right solution for you? And if it's available, obviously uh, try it, use it, and find it for yourself. Uh, and the other thing is, does it make sense for the resource you're creating? I would say uh, we talked about DNS over DSC, uh, and that probably would make sense as well to be able to reverse uh, reverse DSC, the, the configuration uh, that you have for your DNS servers. That would be interesting things to have. It's not implemented at the moment, and uh, we have no plans for it, but if the maintainers one day think, okay, let's give it a try, completely up to them. I, I have no, that, that doesn't affect the DSC resources. That doesn't affect, you know, what's going on in there, so why not? Does that answer the question? And, uh, yes, it does. Just just one point, I guess. Would you would you like to see the reverse DSC um, component added into the component, or is your is, is the preference to keep it as a separate um, module? Um, because so, because so, because it's separate so, so as. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> I was going to say because I know the base reverse DSC is is a separate module in itself, but then there's the helper um, extensions for the various components. So uh, I guess my question is, should if we if it was to be implemented for DNS, should be should it be one of those helper DNS extensions, um, you know, reverse DSC DNS as an uh, example name, or should it be folded into the community DS, uh, DNS module? Am I making sense? Yes, the. Uh... My answer is the less code we have to maintain, the better we are, right? If the maintainers are really keen on using it and they know they will maintain it because they're already the maintainers, then that's why it's completely up to them because they will maintain it. But the, the thing is, the more code you have, the more code you have to maintain. That's the only drawbacks I see. Uh, if it provides value to uh, the consumer of the resources and the module, then why not? And, and that's completely up to the maintainers and the contributors. I don't think that I have, uh, whether I have a preference or not for that is, uh, like if there's no impact into the quality or the security or these things, I don't I, I don't see why I would have an opinion against or for it, or at least against it, I don't see why. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, thank you, that's great. You could maybe just raise an issue in any repository and ask the maintainer to say, do you, do you you know, would you take this? You know, it's yeah. going to add value. And and I'll be honest, I haven't been uh, digging through like the code, how, what you need to do to implement and things like this. Uh, but uh, but you see, SharePoint DSC, they've done it. They've got the, already a huge code base, and I don't think that in terms of uh, overhead, it's that uh, that big. So uh, and they've they've taken it because they're using they're using it and they have like uh, because you know it's really lively. Uh, SharePoint is tied to um, uh, start to SQL Server. Does SQL Server has it actually? Johan does it as well? Um, it, it's it's a, a PR is proposing to add it, but uh, it's uh, on hold and I haven't got uh, gotten time to get back to it to, to look uh, as you said how how does this actually work? What what is necessary to make this work? Um, so it's uh, it's it has been pending there for uh, a year or more, uh, unfortunately. But I haven't got a, got the time to get back to it. So the the two the two resources I actually have it today it's uh, SharePoint DSC and Microsoft 365 DSC, and it's, because it's the same maintainers. Yeah, it's coming. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. It's coming from Reverse DSC originally. I believe has been done by Nick Charlebois, and yeah. Um, and uh, Arnie has been really active into those repositories as well. And that's why it was more naturally going uh, into there. Uh, so um, so that's why it's, it's more for historic reasons than anything else. But, but ju just to understand that, the reverse DSC thing, is it following the approach of separating config from config data, or is it generating just a configuration, large configuration that contains everything? That's a good question. As far as I know, I'm no expert. As far as I know, uh, maybe someone can chip in, but as far as I know, it only generates the DSC configuration. So it doesn't separate yeah. the data from uh, from the uh, DSL. So yeah, it generates the That's DSL. That's my recollection, yes. Yeah, so that would help in a lab, but if you want to go into production and you want to follow the best practices, then the reverse DSC is not of a very big value, is it? I think the scenarios, and I, I was trying to figure out how best to inject this in the conversation, but uh, the scenarios where reverse DSC seems like it makes the most sense are like 
I, I know it's been used a lot whenever uh, like a consulting organization was brought in and they wanted to quickly clone what was in production and reproduce it in a lab so they could troubleshoot without any risk of impact. So in that scenario, you know, you're not really using it for deployments. It's kind of a, a tool set. So it's a little like I, I'm not as concerned about you know the the separation of data. Um, the other scenario though that I have heard where I think maybe it would matter is if you have two separate environments and you want to keep them synchronized. Um, the example that I've heard is like departments in a university and they want to sort of use something like this as a code base to keep uh, SharePoint environment. Um, like to keep governance requirements the same across environments. That's very interesting and I, I, I can see how it would be used, but I would think uh, to your point, uh, then starting to separate environmental data would be a big benefit. Yeah, so I agree. I agree that, uh, so the thing is, would it be better to be able to separate the DSL from the config data? Yes, definitely. Um, at, but at the same time, uh, it's better to have one than none, right? So if worst case scenario, when you do this, you can actually look at the configuration and then extract it. So uh, it, I would say maybe it could be improved and I'm sure they would accept your pull requests, but, um, but uh, that's the thing. Like I, at the moment it generates a configuration, docu a configuration script, sorry. So you could, yeah, you could extract it. And, and as Michael said, that's a very good use case for uh, generating something like cloning, I would say, an environment on its configuration quickly. And I'm just checking uh, the chat because I haven't looked at it at all. OK, no one. Good. Um, so there's also a few changes that went into uh, DSC resource doc generator, DSC resource dot common. I can't remember what went into common. Maybe Johan remembers. No, 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 I don't remember. It was probably it was probably a small fix or something, something small. Um, I don't think there was a big change in DSC resource dot common. And um, DSC resource the test again. We making some changes to improve the Pesta um, to to improve the Pesta support for Pesta five. So traditionally, and you can, may remember, everything is supporting Pesta four to ten. Uh, four ten one, I think, is the latest version. And um, and then we are trying to support Pesta five, and I think the DSC resource the test is mostly there. There's uh, just uh, some parameters that are not uh, supported yet, and they are in four point ten, uh, but that should not impact most of the workloads. And uh, the things that we need to do now is uh, probably start converting some resources, some some uh, repositories to uh, Pesta five. Uh, the the current versions of Pesta 5, like there's quite a fair bit of change, and I always remember uh, remind you that there's a blog post around the conversion, and um, Pesta 5 is really good. Uh, you should really look into it, learn a bit the new ways. They're a bit awkward when you're used to something else, but it's really good. Um, and I would say it's probably a bit faster as well, so that's always something you can take. Uh, it does a few things differently, but if you have any question, again, jump into the um, jump into the um, uh, Slack channel and then ask questions there. And there's a testing Slack channel as well, where the maintainer of Pesto is already uh, quite often answering questions. So feel free to jump there. Uh, Ryan, you wanted? To... Yeah, yeah just, Ryan. just thinking um, with the look to move away from uh, Pesto 410 to Pesto 5. Um, one of the things that I find with us as a community, because we're so, di you know, we're, we're spread around the, 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 the planet, there's a lot of disconnect within who can do something at certain points. Would it be worthwhile trying to do some sort of DSC community hackathon to get all of these together to pass the five as something over a course of maybe a weekend? I want my weekends. Uh, <laughs> I already don't have much of my weekends, so uh, maybe not. No, I. I so I just wanted to throw an idea out there. You know, think about it yes. outside of this call because I think it would be a good thing for pulling the community back together a little bit, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, maybe something we can discuss later. My my just uh, on the top of my head right now, I would say that would be interesting to do. Yeah, hack month that could be interesting. Should we do it for uh, hack month? There's a lot of things to do, and I don't know if just the best of one is the uh, top priority. And I think uh, we still need, and, and I'm thinking uh, Johan, myself, and whoever would, wants to help, we've got a few things to iron out um, into the tooling before that gets, I would say, to the top of the priority. But and at the moment, I would say it's more about uh, maintainers. So if you, as a community, you look at one repository and then, okay, what does it take, like, you know, gaining experience, what does it take to convert? all the tests for a, a small uh, resource module. Because if you start by, for instance, uh, SharePoint DSE, that's probably going to take you a long time because they've got loads of tests. And then we have other things important, in my opinion, to do is uh, improving the uh, class-based um, uh, resource experience, so more documentations around it, and, uh, and then converting the, res the DSE resource to class-based resource where it makes sense at least. Uh, okay, so let's just check if we haven't missed anything in there. Oh yes, um, for sampler, so the question from Raymond earlier was, what did we change in sampler? Answer is, whoa, I can't remember. Um, there's a lot of changes we're doing, uh, which are just clean up. Um, the way sampler used to be, like, uh, you know, that's a module that evolved over a few years. And um, at the beginning, it was a bit messy how we were adding stuff because it was uh, cutting corners. Uh, now we're getting a bit more structured and we get new patterns that we, we're working with uh, Johan to develop to reduce duplication of codes. Uh, a, big, uh, a big duplication of codes we had was setting up the, inviable, uh, the inviables for the build tasks. So we're using Invoke Builder and then some of the tasks are always, the, some of the variables are always the same. What is your source folder? Uh, what is your output folder? So we need to get this because every time you write a task, you need to make you need to leave those parameters available. And the way the parameters are works, um, that's just uh, we're just relying on invoke build for that one. So what we needed to do is remove dupl duplications, and that's I can't rem even remember if I uh, if that's been merged. And Johan can tell me, but we yeah. were changing. Okay, so we were changing yeah. how we how this was doing, and Johan just rewrote like all the block of text that was I don't know maybe uh, what eighty lines per tasks that's been reduced by to one line of tasks for each task and each task file. So that's a lot of code that we, we removed as well. So uh, that one doesn't impact anything, but uh, for us to get to the point where we are confident enough to do this change, publish this change, that takes some time. Uh, all the things that we did is uh, actually thanks to Paul, I don't know if he's online, Paul uh, Shemu, he was uh, pinging me about um, uh, Platypus. So Platypus is for managing help and then allow you, allowing you to generate the mammal files and things like this for your PowerShell project. Uh, so the comment based help is what we use usually, but you have other ways and uh, and this task built in sampler, we're not using it in the community yet because um, we're still working on finding the right workflows, but uh, there's tasks available and you can generate uh, the, the YAML files to be able to generate the MAML for your uh, PowerShell modules. And then you can localize your, uh, your help in whichever language you want and locale you want. And then you can uh, add the mammal file into your repository at build time, and that uh, allows you to have different language for your modules. So that's one of the things we're working on. Uh, it's the task is there. We haven't talked about it because uh, we haven't found the right um, the right uh, workflow yet to incorporate. And one of the reason is when you have common based help and you have a mammal file, if you have common based help, it will uh, always take precedence unless you have something in your command based help, you're like you have a link to the MAML file. And to do that, that means we need to have another task that edits your existing command based help into your build module to be able to point to the um, to the MAML file. So we have these ideas that we want to do, but we're not there yet. Uh, what else? Um, 
Uh, but then, yeah, then we added uh, the code coverage uh, task, build task, uh, convert pest to coverage. Um, and uh, that is ne next step for that is uh, uh, we merge that with a lot of duplicate code. Uh, so, so uh, and that is what I'm working on now to first clean up uh, sampler as a whole, uh, which is um, oh, mostly done. Uh, there's probably more work to be done there, but uh, but now I'm gonna. Uh, take this uh, build task and move out uh, to actually make uh, commands that create a new Yakoko file, a JAML uh, file, uh, and uh, reduce the duplicate code in that uh, command. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Yorix, Yorix uh, functions that, that uh, update statistics and uh, merge Yakoko files also do things that this uh, uh, new task does. So there's a lot of code that can be reduced, a duplicated code that can be reduced. So that's the next step. And uh, after that, I'm going to update the actual templates for samplers. So they, so when we create new modules, that the coverage uh, functionality is already in into the templates. They are not now. Uh, so yeah, that's the plan. Um, yeah. But it's gonna probably take a couple of weeks. Yeah, and then and then for things that uh, that Johan does, usually is good at documenting it. So always uh, we should actually announce it a bit more than we do. But um, there's also articles in the blog posts and um, updating. Oh yeah, that's another one we forgot to mention. So sampler GitHub tasks. Uh, did we discuss that last community call? I can't remember. I, okay, yeah, maybe I we did you, it. Uh, yeah, you did. I think. Yeah, I did. Okay, I'll, I'll just remind. Yeah, I'll just remind quickly. So, um, the sampler things is mainly built around GitHub to be able to uh, use this with GitHub as an open source project, and then uh, be able to uh, use all this automation to quickly, and you can adapt to your environment or to your requirements uh, with your custom tasks. But uh, sometimes people want to use it, and I know people use it outside of GitHub in their private, in their on-prem environment. And for instance, they don't need to do anything with GitHub. They need to use their own um, their own integration, let's say, with GitLab or with um, I don't know Bitbucket or some other or some other uh, VCS. So the idea was, okay, we don't want to have the GitHub tasks to be within. Um, within the sampler, the main sampler project. So we want to have another module that can just uh, expose those tasks. And then the other reason to do that is because we used to have like a copy of the functions we needed to do this. And instead now we actually using the Microsoft uh, module for uh, GitHub, which is called PowerShell. I can't remember. PowerShell for GitHub, something like this. If that rings a bell to anyone. It's going to be in the required modules. PowerShell. Yeah, that for like the one. So that's the one. So that's the PowerShell um, project for this. So we're using this, which wasn't the case before. So uh, that means less um, uh, less, maintaining, le le less maintenance for us to do because uh, we used to have to maintain the functions we were using. I know we're just using this, and that means when you use the GitHub task, you can do some of the funky stuff because this will be available. All right, so that was another thing that we changed to uh, sampler. That's already a lot. I think we covered the most important ones. There might be like some of the tweaks and things, but uh, that's it. Do you have more questions? Anyone? So again, I've, I've seen many people join since I started. Feel free to just unmute yourself and ask questions or uh, drop it in the chat if you want. No, everyone's happy. So I was saying that uh, initially uh, we plan to have some guest configuration content for this session, and uh, I think uh, Michael and myself would been a bit too busy to uh, to be ready for today. So we'll try to do this the next call, which is in six weeks, if uh, Michael uh, thinks it's okay. Michael, Michael's always up for it. All right. If there's too no... many notes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where to unmute? So yeah. 
uh, maybe we can get Michelle to do some demo as well, but uh, we, we'll see. Um, any question? Whether okay, so you can uh, we open up for questions. It doesn't have to be about oh, sorry a specific repository. It does it can be about guest configuration? It could be about DSC. It could be about I don't know DSC workshop if you know what that is. Feel free to ask questions on then or maybe just like general questions. Where do I start doing X? Feel free to ask questions. We've got a good twelve minutes. What have you done recently with DSC? What fun are you making? Very quiet. Usually we do this and then we stop the recording and people start. By the way, <laughs> all right, let's stop the let's stop the recording now and then we'll stay around for discussions. And thank you very much for joining. Um, I just want to remind you that we post those video 